cicadas are happening this year, right? Everyone seems to know this is a brood X year. What does that mean? And what is going on with cicadas? Um, people seem to want us to talk a little bit about cicadas. And it turns out we went to grad school with two of the periodical cicada experts. And they were experts the whole time. The cicadas were periodical. Oh, yeah. They were not periodically expert. No. Oh, I, f I found both John and totally. Dave. This is uh, John Cooley and Dave Marshall, our, our friends from grad school, um, who, uh, yeah, working on periodical cicadas with consistent expertise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so here, um, Zach, if you would show this this map. This is a current brood distribution for periodical cicadas in the mid-Atlantic area. So they do continue on um, off this map, but this is a, this is a decent one that I found. And so, you know, brood X, that's just, that's bec because it's not describing species and it's actually only describing a temporal phenomenon, like when they emerge. Um, so it's not a subspecies either. Um, brood is the word that is being used and they just got given um, Roman numerals and brood X. We happen to be in a brood X year. And so that sounds all exciting and wonderful, but I bet we don't hear nearly as much about, you know, brood XIX, and, you know, and such. Um, so what you see are these overlapping areas where, you know, broods will emerge at, um, at, at for, you know, really just a concentrated few weeks, um, reliably, um, in particular years. And if you look, boy, it's going to be pretty small for you guys, but, um, brood X, for instance, last emerged where it is, uh, in 2004, it's emerging this year in 2021 and it's predicted to, and I pretty much guarantee you that it will emerge again in 2038. So what is that period? So the, the word, the term periodical cicadas refers to a periodicity with which they emerge. So I can, can I fill in a couple of details here as to where these critters are so that people understand okay, what sure. merge means? So what you have is one of the few creatures on earth that can rival human beings for the length of its developmental period <laughs> for no particularly good reason. It's not like they have a lot to learn as kids. What they're doing is they're underground um, attached to the roots of trees getting nutrients and then emerge means that their adult form, the final instar comes into the world and is visible and noisy as hell and very annoying. And um, anyway, so that's the phenomenon in question. It is this emergence. Uh, have you said how many years apart? You no, that's what I was it? just about yeah, getting okay. to. Go yeah. for it. Um, so most of the broods have a periodicity between them, and you can do the math yourself by looking at this map of 17 years. Um, and some of them have a periodicity that is a time between emergence of 13 years. And then they're only out and about as adults for a few weeks. So they spend the vast majority of their lifetimes, you know, underground as, as, as Brett said, eating and, um, and not being findable. And then they emerge and you know, what's up, what's up with those numbers? It's 17 years or 13 years. It's, it's never 14 years. It's never 10 years. Uh, it's never 18 years. Uh, and, you know, again, if this were a classroom, we'd have asked that at the beginning of the class and, you know, ask people to think on it and come back to it and I probably should have started Watch off their there. brains overheat. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, come back to it at the end. And, um, because we were so focused on their stuff this year, uh, this year, this week, forgot to do it. Um, but I mean, the answer, the answer appears to be, um, that, uh, 17 and 13, the thing that they have in common is that they are both prime. And that prime numbers are harder for other animals with shorter uh, emergence times or lifespans or developmental periods to time their, say, migrations or emergences too. Such that if you have something with like a, a two year <clears throat> cycle and it's going to come out uh, every two years and some of those years it's going to be able to find cicadas, it might be able to begin to, to rely on that, but not if you've got a prime number in terms of the periodicity between emergencies. 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 Um, <laughs> well, I, I think that, so that's the other thing. Like we're going to talk a little bit about for people who are in the middle of one of these periodical cicada emergencies, it can feel like an emergency, oh. right? Like it's, I, I've actually, so we've, we've experienced cicadas in the neotropics, um, which we'll talk about a little bit too, different species, not periodical cicadas. They're just there all the time. They're just there making a racket all the time, but it's not this kind of racket. Yeah. Right? Well, it's a pretty bad racket. It tends to be loud when it's sunny, but uh, so let's talk a little bit about why selection would have done this. I, yeah. I agree the prime number thing is the place to focus, but in some sense, many things uh, do something called predator satiation, yes. where 
basically, if you imagine that there's something out there that eats another thing, the thing that gets eaten can partially win by not being available at all and then suddenly being available in such large numbers that the thing that eats them has gotten to very low uh, population density because there isn't a lot to eat. And then suddenly there are too many to eat. And so whatever it is that eats them does the eating and fills itself up. And most of the individuals are free from predation. So even within brood X, if they just spread themselves out, if they emerged over the course of the spring and summer in the place where they're currently emerging, uh, you know, there would presumably be crows and such, there'd be lots of things that would come in and basically make a season out of it. Yeah. As opposed to it's going to be super high numbers for a very short amount of time. And the and it's this is not a group selectionist argument, right? This is a, there's actually safety in numbers argument that yes, some of you will die, but more of you would have had you spread out your emergence. So whereas you can be assured that there will be predators on hand at a, you know, a brood X emergence, um, fewer of you, the members of brood X cicada group, um, are are going to end up succumbing to those predators if you all come at it once. So let's fill in the details of who the predators are likely to be here. They're almost certain to be birds, yeah. right? And birds are going to have a very easy time picking off cicadas because cicadas are- Dim. Oh, so dim. So they're dim. They're really dim. Mm -hmm. um, they're dim and they fly like they're dim. And oh, yeah. They really, and they sound, when they fly, they sound like they're dim. They sound like they're short-circuiting. Yeah, they but, do. Um, but in any case, so imagine if you were birds, and many birds are very smart. You oh, know, they are. Something, uh, corvids or something like that, crows. Uh, you could imagine a predator figuring out the pattern of emergences, right, and moving and predicting where the emergence was going to be and that then the population of predators could grow because it would be in the right place every year. So the prime numbers thwart that strategy because you have to nail it exactly. 17 years is a long period and 17 years has to be hit exactly. If it were 16 years, then something that checked every eight years or 16 years would nail it. Mm -hmm. If it's 17, you got to hit that year number on the dot. Yeah. So. That's right. In any case, I think what we're really looking for, and it may be that uh, the ultimate explanation here, I don't know, uh, John, David, you want to write to us and tell us whether or not uh, passenger pigeons have anything to do with this? Um, but it oh, may wow. be that passenger pigeons, <laughs> uh, you know, were predators of these things and that thwarting the passenger pigeons from knowing where to show up was, um, you know, a useful strategy. But I like that, like the brakes are off, like, okay, we can do a little arm waving adaptive hypothesizing here because it's cicadas and passenger pigeons we're talking it's about. Cicadas now. and passenger pigeons. I can be quite so careful. And we yeah. know who holds our feet to the fire. So that's right. Anyway. It's these guys. So actually just quickly show this is an older paper, Zach, but this actually they would have written this while we were in grad school with them. Um, this is Dave Marshall and John Cooley, Reproductive Character Displacement and Speciation in Periodical Cicadas with Description of a New Species, 13-Year Magic Cicado Neotretisum. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, but they basically have septum decim, you know, 17 years and uh, tre decim, 13 years. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway, mm -hmm. the, the point was if you uh, emerge in great abundance and you do so on a prime number, a long prime number of years apart than a predator who tries to figure out the pattern and record it in its migrational pattern is going to have a very confused um, problem. And actually, now that I think about it, yeah. the fact of 13 and 7, if you imagine some population that tries to migrate the pattern, right, uh, the way that the pattern will- A population of a predator or predator the cicadas, yeah. Will mm -hmm. clutter itself by virtue of the fact that some of these things are appearing every 13 years and some are appearing every 17 years. It means that you don't quickly get a repeating pattern of yeah. first you go here, then you go here. Right. Right. Yeah. Anyway, it's all fascinating. No, it's really good. Um, so I- the uh, actually John Cooley is on this paper as well. I want to read just a few paragraphs from this 2020 paper uh, called, and Zach, you may show it. It's published in PLOS Pathogens. It's um, behavioral betrayal: How select fungal parasites enlist living insects to do their bidding. It's a pretty great title, I think. You know, at least tickles me. Um, so I want to read. Um, just the first uh, couple paragraphs under what is active host transmission. Let me make that a little bit bigger. Uh, insects under the explicit control of parasitic fungi and to entomopathogens are sometimes characterized by colorful terms, even colloquially categorized as zombies, a moniker that draws comparison to both fictitious and factual elements of contemporary life. 
I also feel like this is the best written scientific paper I've ever <laughs> read. So, you know, kudos to you, John, and the other authors on this. Though the effects of entomo entomopath, so I've never seen this word before, entomopathogenic fungi on their hosts are a far cry from behavior modifying viruses such as rabies or the phantasmic world of brain eating zombies that drag their way through our popular culture. Both rabies and select entomopathogenic fungi are nevertheless archetypal examples of pathogens that actively enlist their living hosts for successful transmission, a phenomenon referred to hereafter as active host transmission. And so you begin to see a connection maybe to what we were talking about earlier here. Um, victims of the rabies virus experience hydrophobia. They refuse to swallow, which allows the virus to collect around their mouths, and are much more likely to aggressively bite and interact with others. This unsettling rewiring of animal behavior supplants the interests of the victim in favor of the interests of the virus within. The phenomenon of parasite-induced active oh, sorry, what is it? Active host transmission in animal hosts has evolved numerous times across a variety of taxonomic groups. For example, Toxoplasma gondii, a protist parasite, suppresses the fear response of rodents and drives them to seek out feline foes to help complete the life cycle of their protist partner. Horsehair worms, nematomorpha, encourage their host crickets to drown themselves, which allows these parasites to complete their own life cycle in water. Likewise, certain entomopathogenic fungi, such as Massospora species, manipulate their host's sexual behaviors to increase their odds of transmission. Such engagements appear to serve the interests of the fungal pathogen over the interests of their hosts. Just uh, one more, two more sentences here. Manipulation of a host to focus on pathogen transmission is fascinating because it raises questions about the nature of autonomy and shines a light on the physical and behavioral manifestations of parasitism. Active host transmission is a form of biological puppetry in which the pathogen manipulates the behavior of its powerless host. Awesome. Awesome, right? Um, so not awesome that this is happening. No, no. But um, kind of amazing. Um, so I'm going to try to find my notes since, Zach, if you would give that back to me, that would be terrific. Thank you. Um, it's going to be much easier now. Um, this reminds me um, of cordyceps. Uh, which some number of people will be familiar with because it's somehow gotten somewhat famous, famous yeah. of, of late. But cordyceps is a is a big genus. It's a very speciose genus of of uh, fungi, which is I, actually I think maybe not limited to the Neotropics. Maybe I'm not positive about that, but it's very widespread in the Neotropics, which is to say the so called New World tropics. New World um, simply being a uh, societal um, description that um, Europeans discovered it last. Um, and actually humans discovered it last as well. Um, yep. but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't new to the people who were already living here. The point that the Europeans came, but the neotropics, the new world tropics have a ton of cordyceps. And, um, you know, the authors of this paper that I just read, um, a piece of distinguish between what's going on with, um, with active host uh, transmission and what's going on with cordyceps because they say that usually cordyceps, the spores aren't spread until the host is dead. Mm -hmm. But we've seen, we've actually seen cicadas in neotropical jungles that are clearly infected. That yes. have, you know, that have like that have, have the back end of them something. are all fungal. And what they're doing is they're acting in very unusual ways. They're climbing. And and you know this there is a name for this called apparently summit disease where you like you you get infected with this thing and the thing basically sends instructions to your brain because you're a robot and you're like a robot insect not a human you're like I must climb must climb must climb and so they get to the top where um, once the spores are ready to spread they are more likely to spread because you're at the top of the canopy rather than in the understory where it's relatively still. 